In June 1957, John Diefenbaker became Prime Minister of Canada at the head of a Conservative government. And suddenly, Avro, created by the Liberals, found itself without friends in Ottawa. The Arrow was already a financial problem. Now, with hundreds of subcontractors dependent on the program, making everything from landing gear to delicate flight instruments, and with thousands of employees on the payroll, it was a political problem as well. On October the 4th, 1957, the Arrow made its first public appearance before an audience of dignitaries, Air Force officials, and workers. The Honorable George Perks, Minister of Defense in the new Conservative government, told his listeners that the coming missile age did not mean that the era of the manned airplane was over. The aircraft, he said, has this one great advantage over the missile. It can bring the judgment of a man into the battle. Even as the curtains parted and the arrow was paraded into view, Russia was launching Sputnik, and the missile age was truly begun. The argument which Perks dismissed was within months to be used against the Arrow by his own Prime Minister. But on that day, the builders of the Arrow were counting the months and the weeks ahead until it should take flight. I understand the Arrow will undergo high-speed taxiing tests within the next uh, three weeks, but when will it fly? It will fly uh, sometime during the period that it's undergoing these high-speed ta taxi trials. Uh, you say within the next three weeks, this is when we would hope it will be doing its high-speed trials. And sometime during that period, it will fly. And it did fly. On the 25th of March, 1958, Jan Zurakowski climbed into the cockpit of Arrow 201. He made a final instrument check, pressed open the throttles, and released the brakes. The Arrow was ready for takeoff. Every maneuver of the plane was recorded by cameras on the ground and in the two chase planes, piloted by Jack Woodman and Spud Potocki. Controls are behaving quite nicely. I can see no oscillatory motions of any description in them. I think all this, uh, the mirrors and the carriages fact that the whole derivation disappears. I think and the carriage is making this. That's right, it's the side door which is making, the door which comes and closes the undercarriage into it. In flight, the arrow performed like the thoroughbred she clearly was. All the attention to detail, all the elaborate test procedures of the past five years paid off in a flight that was virtually flawless. In the laconic voices of Zurakowski and his countryman Spud Potocki, veterans of the Polish Air Force in Britain 13 years before, you hear the routine communication of two professionals examining the behavior of a piece of machinery as if this test flight were the most normal event in the world. The engines are behaving quite nicely. They are occasionally giving you a, a, a bit of a black puff of smoke uh, coming out of the man, but otherwise I can see there is no problem. That is Roger Jan, as far as I can see from the back, no condition has changed. Uh, Switching out the dumpers now. Fuel eggs, please, to one. The wind is northeast at 10, the altimeter is 0, two, zero. On that first flight of 35 minutes, Zurakowski took the plane to 11,000 feet. On succeeding flights, it was to reach easily its target of 50,000 feet at nearly twice the speed of sound. and managers and Air Force personnel left their shops and offices to watch the return of Arrow 201. Some had even brought their families. 
Zurakowski was later to say that he had never test flown an aircraft with so few problems. But there was something else. Canadians, used to seeing the leadership in technology in the hands of the United States and Britain, were suddenly aware that they had something which looked like the best in the world. And when Zora came down, after this flight of this super airplane, and the snag sheet showed the malfunction of two electrical switches out of 4,000 or thereabout, we weren't surprised. I'm not, you know, I don't want to feel any arrogance about this, but the facts are we had done so much testing because of going straight into production that we had to be right. It was just unthinkable that, that anything could go radically wrong with that aircraft. And it was a very, very successful flight. But the first flight uh, was uh, very simple and very easy. From flying point of view, it didn't present any, any problems. You know, Zurichowski never told you what the hell went on when you you uh, got him to fly an airplane. Because he, uh, he flew them for himself, I think, not for, for you. But uh, he was uh, certainly a superb pilot. <laughs> There's no question about it. 22 years ago, Reg Lane was a group captain in the RCAF, attached to the Avro plant and the Arrow program. He recently retired as Brigadier General Lane, Deputy Commander of NORAD at Colorado Springs. He was one of the spectators in that crowd on the edge of the runway. It was absolutely magnificent when that aircraft flew the first time and the reports that were coming back from the test pilot and the various readouts of the test equipment that was on, on board the aircraft of the performance of the total machine. And of course it was, I think it was a second or third flight, I can't remember precisely when it actually went through Mach 1. Now that was a truly incre incredible accomplishment and in, those, in those days and uh, at that stage of the design of modern jet airplanes. Truly phenomenal effort. Well, of course, uh, everyone's spirits just rocketed when the initial reports came through on the first test flight of the airplane. And uh, we knew that we had a winner. It was a, a fantastic performing aircraft. I mean, Avlo's commitment was to build an airplane that would give the Air Force 1.5 mark. Our performance boys thought we could do 1.6 mark with it. As it turned out, we actually flew that airplane to 1.9 mark number. And uh, had we continued the development of the Iroquois engine, uh, the Iroquois engine powered aeroplane, we have a lighter engine for more thrust, and we had a 2.3, 2.4 mark number potential. In 1958, there wasn't another aeroplane in the world that was any near, anywhere near being competitive with this aeroplane. The project was just on a, had a lot of national pride. You know, you, you, you just go home at night and, and uh, people want to hear about it, and you tell them about it. I remember Bob Rice had a garage down the road from the airport. And he used to call me. I was it taking off today, and I'd say, yeah, take what time? I'd say, oh, I don't know, probably about 10 o'clock. And he'd be out in front of the garage with his people. He wouldn't serve anybody, no gas, waiting for the airplane to take off and go over to the gas station. For the airplane, that's what everybody wanted, you know. It was something they could look at and say, hey, that's what we did in this country, and I think it was terrific. Through the summer of 1958, Arrows 201, 202, and 203 chalked up 57 flights, totaling some 61 hours. Each flight provided valuable lessons about the plane's capabilities. 204 made six flights beginning in October, and 205 flew only once on the 11th of January, 1959. But by that time, the Arrow was already under sentence of death. In the summer of 1958, General Perks and Finance Minister Donald Fleming had made an official visit to NORAD headquarters in Colorado. The American plan for North American defense included Canadian fighter squadrons, the radar warning system, and the Bomark missile. Perks now became convinced that the bomber was becoming obsolete, that if Russia were going to attack North America, it would do so with nuclear missiles. The arrow would be useless against such an attack. If fighters were needed, he now had assurances from the Americans that the United States could make them available in quantity. The logic of this was not lost on his colleague, the Minister of Finance. 